And now, Veep Thoughts by Kamala Harris. It is time for us to do what we have been doing, and that time is every day. This has been Veep Thoughts by Kamala Harris. BlazeTV.com slash Stu is the place to go to subscribe to Blaze TV. I encourage you to do so. The promo code there is Stu, and it'll save you 10 bucks. Today we have Angela Morabito on Leah Thomas and her escapades. Sarah Gonzalez is going to be on. She had an, an interesting interaction with the Beto O'Rourke campaign that we want to show you. By the way, the Veep Thoughts that we started the show with today is Sarah Gonzalez's favorite Veep Thoughts. The quote that she loves from Kamala more than any other. You can see all the Veep Thoughts in one place at veepthoughts.com if you'd like to share those with your friends who happen to like Kamala. But today we start by doing Zelensky. Hmm. What is it about our society, and particularly our media? Whenever there's a new event in a new place, we have to come up with 900 different pronunciations and spellings of all of their names. Why is this? Why does this keep happening over and over and over again? It was Osama bin Laden. It was Osama bin Laden. It was Al-Qaeda with Q-A-I-D-A and Q-U-I-D-A and Q-A-E-D-A. And it just seems to change indiscriminately from day to day to day to day. I don't even under, uh, I don't understand. Gaddafi, and it was Gaddafi, and it was uh, Qatar and Qatar and Gutter. Uh, we had the Kiev Kiev thing, which is one. This is a sort of a behind the scenes point here, but I'll tell you how my brain works and and why the hard work I do to bring the show to you every day. I saw this is going back a while now, going through old Joe Biden speeches when he was in the corruption situation with Ukraine. And at one point he said Kiev. And I was like, what an idiot. This guy's just saying Kiev. He doesn't even know it's Kiev. Another terrible mispronunciation or slur or gaffe or whatever it was from Joe Biden. Uh, and so I was about to go make fun of him. And then I was like, you know what? Maybe, maybe I should look this one up first just to make sure I'm not screwing it up. Turns out that a re the reason, of course, they, they call it Kiev, which some people now know, but nobody knew at the time, it seemed, uh, is that that's the Ukrainian pronunciation of it. That's the Ukrainian uh, way to, uh, to, to do Kiev where Kiev is sort of, uh, if you say essentially, well, Kiev is, Ukraine is basically Russia, you'd call it Kiev, where Kiev is sort of the Ukrainian way. And that's, you know, look, I think they're on the right side of this thing, so I'm going to go ahead and use Kiev. You can use whatever you want, but can we at least come up with some sort of standard of the way to spell Zelensky? I mean, I, I don't think that's asking too much. My, our own Pat Gray mentioned, it to me, me, uh, mentioned this to me at first, and now I can't stop seeing it everywhere. Uh, there's actually an article on CNN about how to spell a word that CNN has to spell on the air every single day. CNN uses the single Y spelling for Zelensky, Z-E-L-E-N-S-K-Y, while Fox and MSNBC go with the double Y for Zelensky, Z-E-L-E-N-S-K-Y-Y. -Y. The New York Times and the Washington Post are both single Y organizations. The Associated Press is a double Y outlet. Reuters goes in a completely different direction, spelling his last name Z-E-L-E-N-S-K-I-Y. So what is the actual truth? Like, why is there this disagreement? Now, I know there's, you know, languages can be a little difficult at times. You have translations and such. I get it. But, I mean, this should be easy, right? Like, can't we just ask the guy? He's, like, everyone's seemingly talking on the phone with him all the time. Can somebody ask him how to spell his freaking name? Well, apparently this has happened. Zelensky himself has spelled it Z-E-L-E-N-S-K-Y-Y -Y on his passport. 
There you go. In May 2019, his administration said he preferred that spelling when his name was transliterated from the Cyrillic to the Latin alphabet. So there you go. Z-E-L-E-N-S-K-Y-Y. And I feel like, you know, if we are going to just go to Leah Thomas and say, hey, what gender are you? And she's going to say, uh, girl. And we're like, oh, I guess it's a girl. Then in, in this situation, we're just going to go to Zelensky and say, what do you want your freaking name to show up on as the screen? I mean, what do you want? What spelling? I want the two Y's. I guess you get the two Y's. I don't think I'm going to be given the man, girl, the man, uh, female thing. I don't want to do that. But I will give you your own spelling of your name. So congratulations, Z-E-L-E-N-S-K-Y-Y. Uh, I, look at this. This is in Google. If you type in Z-E-L-E-N-S-K-Y-Y, it tries to autocorrect you to Z-E-L-E-N-S-K-I-Y. And now, now I, this brings up all sorts of questions. Because if we don't know the actual spelling of Zelensky's name, is it possible, and I throw this out there as a theory only, this is a bit of speculation, but is it possible that he is related to the auto parts king from Tommy Boy? The name's Zelensky. I make car parts for the American working man because that's what I am, and that's who I care about. John Zelensky's the auto parts king. I mean, it's the same name. Now, I know it's uh, spelled differently, but that doesn't freaking seem to matter. And I will say... Zelensky, a comedian in Ukraine, became president. Dan Aykroyd, also a comedian. I think there could be a very good chance these guys are related. And we broke the news here on Stu Does America. I'm a little, I'm a little perturbed about the whole Zelensky thing and the way it's being treated in the media. I feel like we're getting, we're getting wild uh, extremes on this and basically only wild extremes on who is Zelensky and how should we be thinking about this guy? We know he's in a situation where his country's being invaded. We're seeing the pictures of the dead bodies and the explosions and the terrible destruction. And of course, we, we empathize with that in a real way. Um, but who is this guy? We're seeing both sides of this. Uh, Madison Cawthorn, he's a con congressman. He, he called Zelensky a thug and a Ukrainian uh, government evil in a video, and he's getting all sorts of heat about that. And, you know, look, I, there's, there's a little bit of this that happens to me. I, I definitely have a tendency to want to avoid the thing that everyone loves and is doing, especially online. You know, like, everyone's like, oh, Zelensky's the greatest guy in the world. And it's like, I, I can feel, there's a little internal pull. I push that away a little bit. I am uh, not the guy who follows everyone onto the bandwagon. And, you know, sometimes to my own de detriment, I will say, I didn't even start Breaking Bad until like season four because I was, everyone's like, oh, you should watch Breaking Bad. Shut up. You should watch Breaking Bad. Shut up. All right, I'll watch it. Oh, this is great. There's that contrarian part of me that kind of sees Zelensky. I, I see him sort of how I see Wordle, you know, the thing that's, uh, I, I don't know if Wordle is a fun game. It may be the greatest game of all time, but I'm never going to know that because everyone tweeting all of their little Wordle graphics every day is too annoying. It's too annoying for me to overcome and actually give it a chance. That's a problem with me. I understand it. And there's a bit of that going on with Zelensky. I mean, yeah, he's doing an admirable job in an impossible situation, and that's notable. But we also shouldn't go too far the other way either. The guy is just a guy like you and like me. And yes, he's, I think, handling this uh, situation with, uh, with some bravery, and he's in a very difficult situation trying to manage an invading army. But like, I mean, do we need this? Zelensky and Biden, defenders of democracy, come on. This is what they try to do. If Zelensky's doing a great job and, and, he, and he's, he's a hero, what if we tie him to Biden? Will that work? Or how about this? This tea is as strong as Zelensky. A Psalm company names its black blend to honor Ukraine's president. Oh, gosh. I mean, I just... I, he might be the greatest guy in the world, but I just can't take this. How about the impro improbable rise in endless heroism of Volodymyr Zelensky? By the way, we're going to do another show on how to spell his first name because they can't figure that out either. I mean, look, listen, this, listen to this gushing. This is from GQ. Uh... uh uh, as I write this, Vladimir Zelensky, the most improbable national leader in the world, just might be the world's most popular. By now, everyone knows his life story, surreal outline, uh, a comedian who rose to fame with the portrayal of a president, becomes the real president, then transcends it. But I didn't know this. The erstwhile Ukrainian voice of Paddington Bear 
The guy's the voice of Paddington Bear. The guy who's leading the the ultimate hero of the universe is the voice of Paddington Bear. I don't know why that hits me so weird, uh, but it does. Um, and it also says he's the star of a dozen crappy, they use a different word, a dozen crappy comedies and one decent one. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, what's this guy? I don't know. I just found that to be funny. Uh, it's a, it's a really an, ama an amazing thing to watch happen. And I think there is a natural instinct, as I kind of described in myself, is when you see someone put up there as this perfect human being, a god among men, to, to recoil from that a little bit. And I think that's probably healthy. On the other side, uh, there's an instinct to, to go too far and, and try to turn this guy into some major criminal or some terrible thing when we don't really have that. Uh, that's not really, there is a, a long history of corruption in, U in Ukraine. And, and honestly, like Zelensky was elected to try to put an end to that. That's not to say that he's he's perfect and he's done the right thing in every situation. But it is a, an, an important note when you talk about the corruption in Ukraine. Look, the truth is that Zelensky is not God. He's not Satan either. The only thing you can say for certain right now is that for about three weeks, he's doing a really good job with the public facing part of this war. Is he some military tactician? I don't know. Is his, is his regime going to last two more weeks from today? I don't know. I will say that the public facing part of a war is a big chunk of your job as president, rallying people behind your cause, securing help from friends and allies, trying to inspire your people to fight off an invasion. And it makes you kind of worry about having Joe Biden as a president because, you know, he can't do any of that stuff. He is completely inept when it comes to trying to inspire a people. He can't even get through a sentence. But there is too much, a little bit, I think, of everything right now going on with, with Zelensky. He's not a you know, serial killing pedophile and puppy abuser, as far as I know. He's also not the one exalted hero that will come and levitate us all to heaven, as far as I know. Coming off of Afghanistan, where like the leader of the country was on a plane out of the nation because it got a bit too windy on like Thursday morning, Zelensky does look like a hero. People do look to their leaders in times like these. But it's important to remember why they look to their leaders in times like these. Desperation. More and more, I'm noticing people in Western countries who are currently free of the sort of strife going on in, in Ukraine having these same instincts. Missiles aren't hitting our country yet, and we're still on this constant hunt for some sort of supreme being that in a suit that's gonna come in and save us from the messy outflows of the freedoms we enjoy. Whether it's you know, this hero worship of uh, Bernie or AOC or uh, the notorious RBG on the left or of Donald Trump or DeSantis or whoever is next on the right, I mean, it's great to want the best person for the job, but we're never going to solve the issues we face by putting all of our faith in man. It just doesn't work. Plus, how can we solve all the important problems in the world if we can't even figure out how to spell Zelensky? Yeah, you know, thinking about the last few weeks, what a big time it's been for cryptocurrencies. Uh, you're seeing the real promise of cryptocurrencies in a place like Ukraine, where people who would have, you know, their currencies are being destroyed. They're having to flee across borders with no time to prepare. And, you know, some people, the average person in Russia, too, having their currency destroyed. The availability of cryptocurrency has helped tons of people over the past just few weeks alone. Tika Tawari is a person who a lot of people may have heard about, Tika, uh, about uh, cryptocurrencies from first. I mean, this guy was really early on this. In 2016, he was talking about it. He came on the radio show a bunch of times talking about the promise of crypto. And people kind of called him crazy. They thought it wouldn't go up that high. And it did go up very high. And then he said, you know what? I think it's going to go even to 40,000. And everyone called him nuts. And look, for about a year, it looked like he might have been nuts. It went through this bubble, it came down, and it sat down there for a while. In 2020, Bitcoin was $3,000. Today, it's what, $42,000? We've seen Bitcoins and many altcoins recently touching all-time highs. We're talking about a $3 trillion asset class. It's going to be hard to make this thing go away. Uh, you can make big-time profits with cryptocurrencies. And, uh, you know, it's a bit of an up-and-down market, but you need to really understand it if you're going to get involved. If you haven't bought Bitcoin, you are not too late for this. You're not at the end of this 
You're still at the beginning. Do your own research, but don't wait. Sign up for Tika, Tika's uh, Palm Beach letter right now. It's at BigTReport.com. BigTReport.com. It's Tika Tawari's Palm Beach letter now at BigTReport.com. Well, amid protests, Penn swimmer Leah Thomas has become the first known transgender the first known transgender athlete to win Division I National Championship. I like how they leave that open. Like, we don't know. Uh, Mary Lou Retton, we don't know. We would, we'll have to look back. We, we, we'll never know. Um, let me, uh, let's go into this because this is a fascinating uh, story, and uh, I don't even know what to make of it. Uh, Angela Morabito is with us. She's back on the program, spokesperson for the Defense of Freedom Institute, former press secretary for the U.S. Department of Education. Angela, how are you? I'm doing great, Stu. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Um, I don't know that the result was a huge surprise last night, uh, but, you know, it, there, there did seem to be some protests there. There did seem to be maybe not such a warm crowd uh, reaction to Leah Thomas as she wins yet again. I mean, it's hard to believe that this is going on. That's right. It looks like when it comes to women's sports, because of transgender athletes and the rules surrounding it, second is the new first. We're telling biological women that the best they can hope for is second place. I can't think of a more harmful message to share to women and young girls. And look, I have absolutely no animosity towards Leah. Uh, if she walked in the room right now, I would treat her with you know the utmost respect that you would give to anybody, right? The problem is it's bigger than one person. It's a system that is allowing biological women to be systematically and routinely marginalized at sports they work really hard in. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I you know I have a, a young daughter who does gymnastics and volleyball and. You know, like, I, I want her to be able to compete against other biological girls. That's the, that's the, the category that she's in. And, I, you know, I feel like this is completely unfair. We're seeing interviews with people who were left off of the team, left out of these meets that just missed while Leah Thomas was taking a slot. I mean, this is just completely unfair. And I, I don't, it's, as you point out, we, of course, should be uh, n nice and, and, and open to everybody. And, and, of course, obviously, we all understand that. But it's like it's completely unfair, and it's, it's really a problem at this point. I mean, we, there, there was this discussion years ago of, like, a slippery slope. And the slippery slope gets demeaned a lot here. But, you know, five years ago, we would have we outlined this exact scenario as an example of what could happen if we keep going down this road. And here we are. Yet not long ago, Stu, this was a South Park episode about transgender athletes and women's sports. It used to be thought of as so ridiculous that it would never happen. Well, here we are. And you hit the nail on the head, right, when you talk about fairness, that fairness isn't supposed to be this special favor we have to ask for from other people. That should be the baseline. And there are laws in place to protect it. Title IX is there in part for female athletes, but mostly for, for all students so that everyone can access an education free from sex discrimination. Now we're watching the Biden administration potentially rob Title IX of so much of its purpose. It was there in part to protect women's sports. In the coming months, they may very well use it to try to undermine women's sports. So it's so important that people understand this issue and that they're prepared to stand up for their rights. It definitely seemed like there's a uh, quite a quite a quite a U-turn on the direction of the department that you worked in when you were part of the Trump administration. Uh, you know, this this uh, the, the direction we're going here now with uh, Miguel Cardona. Um, can you tell us about this guy? Who is he and what is he doing here? I mean, it, it doesn't seem like uh, these are rational policies that ag agree with with fairness in any way. Well, Secretary Cardona was, you know, appointed by President Biden to, to help with the Biden agenda, right? That That's his position. That's what he is there to do. He used to run the public school system in Connecticut. And despite being a bit too cozy with the teachers unions, he was generally well respected. Now, he's made a lot of decisions since then in his current role that are a problem. Look, he's extended the student loan freeze for much longer than this pandemic his economy has been in place. He may extend it again, essentially hollowing out the student loan program from the inside. And then you have this issue of gender. Now, Secretary Cardona testified before a House committee last summer, and someone asked him how many genders are there, and he refused to answer. So I don't know, maybe that's common core math. Maybe we're <laughs> really not teaching arithmetic in schools anymore. But come on, the answer is two. Yes, it is two. I will say, too, now, I mean, as a, a product of Connecticut public schools, 
I can tell you, uh, <laughs> he should not get promoted out of that gig. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe it's changed in the past years, but as a guy who went to Connecticut public schools, not exactly the uh, high point, I think, of American education. Um, at least at least my grades weren't very good. Um, let's talk a little bit about the direction of this generally, because I'm fascinated about this. You guys, when you were in, uh, in, uh, in D.C. Um, and, 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 and affecting these policies, I thought you guys did a lot of brave things while you were there. For example, um, you know, there is this approach to, um, uh, to sexual assault on campus, which is obviously any time that that exists, it's a horrible, horrible thing and needs to be dealt with seriously. But th many of these universities had come down with policies where anyone who was accusing anyone of anything wound up being able to get the person they were accusing thrown off campus with no attempt for them to even be able to defend themselves. We saw this with uh, high profile athletes, many of them African-American who were accused by uh, girls and women in, in college of things that doesn't seem like they did and wound up having their lives ruined. Uh, this is this is not fairness either. And I feel like this agenda, this sort of woke agenda that the Biden administration has embraced is bringing us down the completely wrong road. Well, I can tell you that Secretary DeVos did do a very brave thing in making this 2020 Title IX rule. And it was made controversial. This controversy was ginned up out of nothing. This rule protects all students since it uh, was, was, was enacted. It has been there for everyone. It's withstood countless legal challenges because it does the very basics of due process, right? It says that schools need to have a free and consistent and transparent process for handling sexual assault claims. It ensures that things like sexual harassment is codified into, well, sorry, I'm tripping over myself here. There's so much in this rule. <laughs> but what it says is that every school needs to treat all students fairly. It contains protections for both the accused and the accusers. And it makes sure that this, the process for handling sexual assault claims is fair to all students. This should be the baseline. It shouldn't be controversial. It's honestly kind of the basics that we should expect from our government as Americans. And yet you saw people react because they wanted to go back to the bad old days of kangaroo courts where a false accusation was enough to derail someone's whole life. Yeah, that just seems like the wrong direction. All this seems like the wrong direction. And part of me looks at, for example, the Leah Thomas situation where this is one that I think just smacks people in the face. You know, th some of these issues admittedly are difficult to deal with and they're hard for people to understand and to relate to. I mean, most people are not in these situations and it can be really complicated. But it's just not complicated when you see something like this. We are supposed to sit here and say that Leah Thomas is a woman when she's, she, I mean, I don't know if you saw the picture of her standing with her medal. She's like nine feet tall compared to the people she's swimming against. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's obvious that this is a completely unfair thing. And I think this hits parents hard. They see their daughters and they think of themselves in these positions with, with no ability to, 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 uh, to be able to rise to the heights that they would be able to in normal circumstances all because we're all lying to ourselves and not admitting what we're seeing with our own eyes. That, that's right. This is so, so obvious, right? And people talk about the science behind it. People talk the, about the rules of specific sports. Well, you don't need to be a swimming expert and you don't need to be a scientist to know that what's happening in, in women's college swimming is patently unfair and that women are getting robbed of opportunities, of titles, of scholarships that are supposed to exist just for them. So the Defense of Freedom Institute is extremely concerned about the future of Title IX. We are going to be looking into what the Biden administration ends up proposing to do with the, with the rule, because this affects all students. And, and it's important to note that this isn't just a college issue. This applies from kindergarten all the way on up. And it's about protecting all students from sexual harassment, sexual assault, all kinds of misconduct that need to be taken seriously. This is no joke. I mean, I, I know that People, you know, like to meme their meme the swimming races and all sorts of stuff. But at the end of the day, this is about all students. It's about a very serious safety issue. It's true, and, and I think like, you know, look, everything in the, on the internet turns into a meme. I guess you can't avoid that, <laughs> uh, you know. But it is, I, it is, I think, confusing to people on how to deal with this. I think there's this idea that. One of the things conservatives have done over the years is sort of just roll over on these on these difficult issues because they're uncomfortable to talk about and it makes everybody uncomfortable to mention it. And you don't want to put people in a bad situation. I think conservatives generally are are nice people and they don't want to they don't want to cause that sort of conflict. 
But at the same time, if we don't stand up and say these things and be honest about what's really going on, you do go down this slippery slope and then everything gets out of your control. What's the right? Is it is it legal? Is it just talking about it more often? What's the right way to, to approach this issue? Well, awareness is certainly a piece of it, but protecting Title IX, protecting women's sports is a huge piece of it, too. Another part is just making sure that as, as a society, we don't let second become the new first, that we stand up for what women deserve. We stand up for equality and we teach the next generation what that means. I think that kids are getting a huge lesson in, in what fairness is and isn't when they see this happen in both high school and college sports. So it's important for all of us to be aware of the changes that may be coming for Title IX, because with awareness, Awareness makes everybody able to speak up, and that includes, you know, speaking up to your local school system. It includes making your voice heard at the federal level. It is going to take a full team effort, to borrow a sports term there, uh, to make sure that we protect the rights of women through Title IX. Yeah, I mean, I, I saw that they were people on the internet were, were calling, um, you know, second place women's gold. And I and, and like at first, okay, I chuckled for a second, but then I thought to myself, you know, like as I hate to personalize it again, but it's like I have a daughter who is in sports. And I have to watch this go on and I don't want her to have to come up with, you know, to be striving for some bizarre second place that was created uh, from some weird cultural argument. I mean, that's that's totally unfair to her and every other kid out there. That's right. And I'm sure you see how hard your daughter works. I know that, you know, my, my brother was an athlete and you see how hard these people work at their sport. And then to get to the very highest level of their sport and be able to compete there and then have the rug pulled out from under them, it is no longer a level playing field. That's a terrible message to send. It's unfair to these kids. And honestly, it's the grownups in the room who need to do better. Mm. Well, Angela, I do appreciate what you're doing and everything the Defense of Freedom Institute is doing on this issue. It's really important. Angela Morbido, she's a spokesperson for the Defense of Freedom Institute, former press secretary of the U.S. Department of Education. Thank you so much for coming back on the program. I appreciate it. Thank you, Stu. It's great to be with you. We are going to have a lot of election coverage coming up over the next, jeez, oh what is it, how many months, eight months, as we get it close to the midterm elections. Um, but we can tonight make our first call of a congressional seat. We call the uh, seat in, uh, near the, in the Pittsburgh area for Mike Doyle. We now can confirm Mike Doyle will win in uh, that congressional race. Part of the reason is, and you might say, well, I don't really like the Democrat, Mike Doyle. He's, he's the worst, and I want him out. I, I don't know much about him, but it may very well be true. The only thing I know, though, is that his opponent is also named Mike Doyle. So there's, <laughs> it's Republican Mike Doyle versus Democrat Mike Doyle. So we know Mike Doyle is going to win, and that's going to be our first call. You know now the Libertarian candidate is going to somehow win. Like somebody else is going to win, and Mike Doyle will lose. So I will. Uh, the, the people are going to put the, you know, freezing cold takes is going to put this up on the on the web. But there we go, Mike Doyle, uh, your congressman from from Pittsburgh. Um, okay, and also uh, in Russia, and we know Russia. <laughs> I love this Russia lost all their McDonald's because obviously you can't serve Big Macs to people who live in a country where their leader is insane and invading other countries. I don't know why we would do this. Like we don't want the the average Russian people to eat. I don't, I, you know, honestly, like if you've ever eaten too much McDonald's, you know, that can be a punishment, let alone, uh, it's not really a, a gift. Uh, however, uh, McDonald's, they just basically pulled out. All the restaurants pulled out. And Putin is like, look, all right, you're going to pull out. We're going to take all your restaurants and we're just going to start making similar burgers. And now they have actually opened up a new restaurant. It's called Uncle Vanya. And it basically has the golden arches just turned sideways, <laughs> which is incredible and very close to the plot of coming to America. Because if you remember in coming to America, they had a restaurant called McDowell's. And uh, they had not the golden arches, but the golden arcs. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know how successful this is going to be, but Uncle Vanya's is available now for all of those people who are in Russia who we tried to make not be able to eat, but now can, I guess, get fries. So a really positive outcome to this horrible, horrible story. Trying to buy or sell a home uh, these days, it can be challenging, and that's why you need a real estate agent who can come in and take charge of the situation. 
This is important. I've sold a couple of uh, pieces of property over the years, and I will tell you this, not always great. Not always a great experience. Uh, in fact, w recently I had a uh, house that we had sold, and uh, you know, I was thinking, look, we gotta have this thing painted, we gotta fix this, we gotta fix that, we gotta fix this, and they were like, you know what? I've been looking at the market in this area. You don't need to do any of that stuff. Just put it on the market right now as is. You're going to do pretty much just as well. You're going to get above what you're asking for anyway, and you don't need to do all this work and waste the thousands of dollars. Well, she was right. If you have a good real estate agent, it can make a huge difference, and it's a big financial transaction. It's you know probably the biggest one you'll ever have. Realestateagentsitrust.com is the place to go to find the best real estate agent in your area. It's realestateagentsitrust.com. Go there now, realestateagentsitrust.com. I want to welcome back to the program the wonderful Sarah Gonzalez, host of the News and Why It Matters here on Blaze TV and Sarah Gonzalez Unfiltered on the YouTubes. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't yet. Sarah, how's it going? It's going well. Yeah. It's, it's a Friday. So it is. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm ready. I'm yeah. ready for the weekend. Every I really week am. seems to take approximately 84 years to conclude. Yeah. Do you remember? I, Because I, I, I mean, you've been doing this for a little while mm -hmm. now. I mean, like. Do you remember when the news wasn't crazy every day? I remember having to look for things to talk about. Yeah, yeah. And doing I mean, shows. really search hard too. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't seem to be that way. That is long dead. Which I guess is good job security for us. Yes, so. yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the, the the torment of all of the world's population is great news for us, right. and that we know. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank, thank you, you. <laughs> thank you. Um, all right, I want to talk to you about your uh, the situation that happened with you at a Beto O'Rourke event. Yeah. Now, first of all. How, why are you torturing yourself and making yourself go to a Meadow O'Rourke event? It's a reasonable question. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, I actually, he was having a town hall event in the DFW area uh, that I had heard about, and it was an education town hall. And generally, there's, you know, people handing mics to people in the audience. You get to ask a question, and this guy is running to control the state of Texas. So... I wanted to ask him a question uh, about his support of trans kids in schools and what all that would entail. So I thought, how else am I going to ask this? Which, by the way, our show did reach out to try to bring him on the program so that I could talk to him mm. uh, about some of his positions. And I'm sure you'll be shocked to hear that they never returned our uh, Hmm. Our email. I'm so stunned to hear that. How else am I supposed to ask someone as a constituent yeah. what, you know, how he would handle certain things as governor? Yeah, because you're a, a potential constituent. If he's yeah. to win, he right. would be the governor of the state you live in. And right. you have young kids. Exactly. Who are going to school. Yep. So this is information you probably want to know about. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. And I did, for the record... I did have to, knowing that I would need to uh, not stick out like a sore thumb and not be a huge supporter. Right. I had to, I had to, clapped. <laughs> I held a Beto sign. It all felt, I felt like I needed 10 showers oh. after I got home. It was, it was very bad. See, now we're going to show your video of what happened. And, and this is not, not, not a good moment. And I want to get, I don't want to joke about it too much, right. but I do kind of want to get footage of you clapping to blackmail you with later. Here's bad. Sarah Gonzalez clapping at a Beto O'Rourke event. It was that really, can be valuable footage. It was really bad, but you understand why <laughs> yes, I had no, to I do know. it. Well, but I you like shouldn't have to do it, right? Like, the, a town hall yes. is not supposed to be an event of only people who are mindless autotrons to, to support the guy. You should be there to ask tough questions. I completely agree, but that's not, I mean, I'm, I know you know this, but that's not what this is anymore. Yeah. So it was at a, a United Methodist LGBTQ church that had a big pride flag mm. uh, on top of their sign outside. And it was just, you know, 95% of the people were in gigantic masks. And it was, it was like, I felt like I was not in the same country yeah. when I went in there with this crowd. Okay, so you're, you're clapping dutifully. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're doing the things you're supposed to do yeah. in the crowd. And, and then before we get to the video, you, you, you're, you've approached where he is standing. Right. What, what's going on here before the video starts? Yeah, so after he finished the, you know, the formal part of it, he greets everyone. He takes pictures with whoever wants to take a picture with him. He answers questions that people, you know, they maybe they want to make a comment to him. And so he's socializing with sure, everyone, sure. right? And so I met a gentleman downstairs uh, who wanted to ask him a question about whether or not he knew about the World Economic Forum and, you know, perhaps his involvement in that, if there was any. And so I thought, that's actually a reasonable question to ask our leaders these days. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear the answer. I know a lot of other constituents would probably love to hear the answer. So I held up my phone like a lot of other people in the room were doing uh, to just record the, the interaction at a public event. And that's when it all started. And it all happened, honestly, as quick as it seems in the clip is 
is true to life. I mean, it really mm. did all happen that quickly. Okay, let's take a second here and uh, watch the video. Um, we'll get a description from Sarah as to what happened. If you're listening on podcast and you can't see the video, um, we'll show it to you now and we'll get a description right after. My question was... Oh, sorry, we're not recording. No, 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 sorry, sorry. We're Don't not touch my phone. We're not recording. Don't touch my phone. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. What's your badge number? Why did you just push me down the... That's fine, but did, why did she just put her because hands on me so hard? She asked you to leave, and you're not leaving. No, she didn't. She didn't ask me to leave at all. She pushed me down the stairs. I'm telling you to leave. What is your badge number? Hey, I appreciate you being respectful and not putting your hands on me. Thank you. I mean, what on earth is going on here? So, so many things. Walk us through it. Yeah, yeah, so many things. So I, I had my camera up. Uh, and I, again, I was, I kind of, I mean, I didn't know this gentleman before that day. But we were kind of, we were there at that point together. And um, the, his staffer immediately turns to me. Oh, we're not recording. And I'm like. That's weird because I'm thinking yeah. everyone's – you guys Everyone live streamed the things. event yourselves <laughs> on his Twitter account. Right, like what are you right, talking right. about? Yeah. And as she's saying this, she reaches for my phone. She And you can see it on yep. there. She grabs my phone. She grabs my hand too mm -hmm. and tries to pull my phone from my hand. It's a bizarre thing to do for an aide at an event like I this. I know. I'm like – well, and um, I mean it struck me later. I'm like – they have to be so insecure about their candidate yeah. that they're that panicked right. when they see someone filming at a public event. So, and how does this even end? Like, if she gets your phone, right. what does she do, what do you with do? it? Does what she do you throw do? it away? Right. Does she hide it from you? It's uh, a great question. Goes on there and tries to delete the video. What is, what is happening? I know, okay. I know. So she tries to grab it. Uh, there's like a, a little bit of a scuffle of me trying to maintain uh, my phone, control of my phone. So yeah, so you see her. She goes. She grabs it. Uh, and I am saying, don't touch my phone, don't touch my phone. As I'm saying, don't touch my phone, the officer comes up, grabs me very forcefully by both of my arms and is pushing me um, down to where there's a ramp on one side and some steps on the other and is pushing me. And as I'm saying, excuse me, excuse me, um, if people want to go back and listen, you can hear her say, as I'm saying, excuse me, she says, I don't even got to touch your phone. I can just touch you. Yeah, well, I mean, uh it's a bizarre moment. No directive, you, you no instruction, no warning. Yeah. Hands all over me, assaulting me. And you can see your camera move really quickly, like yeah. something. You can't exactly see her hands on you. Right. But you could see something happens there. Um, and you know, you're not a person who comes on the air all the time and is like, "Hey, you know, these police are terrible. They're right. doing terrible things." That's that's not your reputation at all. Yeah. This is not what you're known for. Right. So, what do you think happened? Was this a someone who was just a Beto supporter there that was like supporting the campaign and was pissed off that you were challenged? What was, what was the, do you have any idea, well, any theories? you know, it's interesting because um, what I've done so far, and my lawyer and I are pursuing all legal options right mm. now, but what I've done so far is um, we've requested body cam footage from the officer because there is a spot where the, the body cam should be, and according to DPD policy, as I understand it, it should have caught that interaction. Okay. Like, it should have been set up to where she would be able to catch the interaction between her as an official law enforcement officer and uh, a citizen when she's interacting with them. Mm -hmm. They claim there are no files that match my request. What that means, I don't know, because now she's under internal investigation. So... Mm. There are a lot of questions that I have, the one you just asked, and also, was she working on city time or was she hired privately by the campaign? I think that's a reasonable question to ask. Sure. They won't answer any of them now because she is under internal investigation because of this incident, not only with internal affairs, but also with the Office of Police Oversight, which is le it's a citizen-led uh, board that mm. also looks over all of these matters. So now they're stonewalling at this point anytime I have a question on why this would have transpired the way that it did. Unreal. And I, I mean, I know, obviously, in the middle of what you know, whatever you're trying to pursue here and whatever might come of it, you can't get into all the details. Right. I, I understand that. Um, but, like, was it... Uh, uh, I mean, you, you, you could have expected, I think, going there, if someone would recognize you or something, right. that they might, you know say something to you, they might not like your presence there, but you couldn't have possibly expected something like that. Absolutely not. And I mean, especially when, if they would have, if the event coordinators or the, the church would have asked me to leave, I, I would have left. I mean, that's right. that's their rule. It's their 
church, you know, sure, they can they, private right, property. They, yeah, can, yeah. they can say that if they want to. It's the problem was that nobody ever told me to leave. <laughs> right. I was there the whole time. Nobody had a problem with it. Nobody had a problem with anyone else doing exactly what I was doing, which was filming and mm -hmm. interaction. Uh, and it was just all it was all very bizarre. Well, when you're there clapping, it's OK. Well, uh, yeah, it's well, totally right. fine. We're, we welcome you here. Of I, course. Honestly, I think it was I think it was the cowboy hat on the gentleman that that really made them nervous. Uh -huh. true, I mean, true story, yeah. because he was he stuck out like a sore thumb. He was the only one in a cowboy hat, mm. obviously, at a Beto event. Yeah. And so I think that they got uh, nervous I, about him. But Beto, I think of was a, such a real authentic Texan that, uh, you know, I could totally see him in a in a cowboy hat. Uh, what do you do you think he has any chance here? I mean, I. It's, we can't look past the fact that he lost to Ted Cruz by only two points. It was a close election. It was. And I think that there is, all we have are more transplants from mm. leftist cities and states that they've left there. They've come here. They've infiltrated. And I just can't help but think they're, they are much more passionate and riled up about this election than Greg Abbott supporters. Yeah. I, I don't know anyone who's very passionate to keep Greg Abbott uh, in in office other than to make sure that the crazy leftists don't right. do all of these things, yeah, right? The, but they're not passionate about the man. The, these people- yeah. They love Beto. Oh, they would kiss his feet. They would kiss the ground he walks on. It's crazy. It's so bizarre. It is, He's it's crazy. Such a dullard. It's crazy, but I just think it, he came very close to taking Ted Cruz's spot. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's just really going to come down to turnout. Now, that was a good year for uh, for Democrats. Yes. And this is this, I think, is going to be a pretty bad year for Democrats. But to your point, I mean, it's amazing. It's an amazing dynamic that tens and hundreds of thousands of people have poured into Texas, particularly in the last two years, to avoid yes. the sort of lockdown policies that have been happening in this blue state, uh, in blue states across the country. Right. They're going to come to this red state and try to turn it back blue, yeah. which I, is mind boggling. It, it really is. I mean, it, it makes you wonder if they have a memory longer than like two minutes where they can remember why it is that they left. But apparently they don't. They can't connect the dots. And, you know, for whatever reason that may be. And I really, I don't know. I think there are a lot of people who live in Texas who are like, we're fine. We're red. We know, we're, we know ourselves. We'll be totally fine. I don't think that that's, tr I think that's a very, uh, I think that's a very scary way of looking at it. Because mm. I think we could get our state taken from us very quickly. Yeah. You, I mean, you got to be passionate about this stuff. Um, I, I hope you'll be able to come on as this winds through. Yeah, I'm sure course. they're going to be very, very forthcoming with information. Absolutely. I'm so sure it's far, a yes. couple weeks. I can't imagine right. Lauren's any longer than that. Right. Uh, but as this winds through, will you keep us updated and yeah, let us know what happens? Absolutely. This is crazy. Uh, Sarah Gonzalez, she's the host, of course, of the News and Why It Matters on Blaze TV and Sarah Gonzalez Unfiltered on YouTube. Uh, Sarah, thanks so much for coming by. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. I'm no, screwing it up. Okay. So here's what happened. Now, an Italian chef making lasagna is not exactly all that notable. Not notable enough for an okay, here's what happened segment, certainly. However, he's become a little innovative with this particular lasagna. And he's decided to deliver it in a sort of new, uh, innovative way, let's say, through a toothpaste tube. Now, the visuals here are revolting, to say the least. A, there's just orange paste of some sort coming out of a toothpaste tube. Uh, the chef says, my desire to experiment with daring new flavors and concoctions by creating new combinations is infinite. There are no boundaries in cuisine. There should be boundaries in cuisine, like putting lasagna in a toothpaste tube. That's a boundary. Look, build that wall. Okay, that's all I'm saying. Uh, he says the idea is to mimic the ritual of washing your teeth with the lasagna ingredients. <laughs> why that? Why would you want to? My brother and I loved eating at breakfast the leftovers cold from the fridge. It brings back memories of my granny. It's a taste of her. I don't want to taste your granny. Okay, this is just me talking here. I have my own set of beliefs, but the first one in line of all the beliefs is no granny tasting. Um, and no food and toothpaste tubes, if I can help it. BlazeTV.com slash stew is the place to go to subscribe to Blaze TV. Do it. Support us. We appreciate it. Promo code is stew. We'll see you next week.